Hey everyone, this is Brittany Bond and my best friend, Michaela Earl. Hello. <laughs> and this is the beginning of an amazing journey of a podcast that I'm starting. I'm so grateful to have you as one of, as well, not one of, as the first person on my podcast. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> so the reason why I'm starting this is because, yeah, it's time to share the vibration, the transmission and I'm so grateful to Faraday. Shout out to Faraday for helping me to buy all the equipment and Rosanna for helping me get my SD card yesterday. Um, so yeah, this is a podcast about everything. Everything and everything everywhere all at once in all the dimensions. That is my new favorite phrase. Oh. Yeah, we had a little mic adjustment. Mic adjustments. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it your new favorite phrase? I just find myself thinking the phrase everything everywhere all at once because that's how I feel. That's how my inside of my brain feels a lot of the times. So. Is that what happened when you did DMT? <laughs> that's literally, I feel like that's a bit more literal. I'm like, we're literally, your brain is everywhere <laughs> and everything all at once. I got um, I to gotta tell them that <laughs> when I had you come. So Michaela is my best friend from New York. We've known each other since... I don't know, 2014, 2015. I keep forgetting the year. Yeah, something long, like long that. Long time. Long, long time, as they say in Thai. And when I moved to Thailand, um, she came out and lived in Chiang Mai in 2016 when I had first moved there. And we like discovered the city together. You lived there for three months, right? Yeah. So that was like when I was, as as the message we got the other day, I was a baby queen. Yes. <laughs> so we, I keep having these random people message about me that I don't know. And apparently someone said I was a baby queen back then. But then I persevered. And now, and and now, now you know a lot more things. Now I know, now I know a lot more now things. Now you get a lot of things. <laughs> I get a lot of things. So now I live on Copenhagen and I had you come visit. And two days after you got there, I was like, I've never done DMT before. I would like to do it. Would you like to do it with me? And she's like what is DMT? <laughs> <laughs> and she said yes. And so we, we blasted off. As my friend Faraday says, we took in some consciousness from the universe. How was it for you? Um, how was my DMT trip? Um, it was measured i would say i got a smaller dose so <laughs> we were very jasmine and i were like should we really give this to her so i remained connected to my bodily form through the whole thing it's great meaning i could sense my yeah i could just sense my body still but lots of i don't know what you would call it sacred geometry um lights colors tunnels i was li literally lifted off the ground and like shuttled around through space um i got a lot of do you think people know what dmt is hold on you didn't know what it was i didn't maybe know we should tell people so dmt is the active ingredient in ayahuasca so in ayahuasca it takes about 12 hours for it to release it's a natural ingredient they work with in the tribes in like south america specifically in peru I think it's a plant. It's a plant, right? I'm not <laughs> representing DMT very well right now, but I, let me tell you, it's amazing. It's the chemical compound. So I think it's... <laughs> we're doing great. <laughs> we're doing great. <laughs> if you want to know what DMT is, it's the letters it. DMT. Look it up. <laughs> so like from a psychedelic perspective, I've tried almost everything. And like if you've done psychedelics, DMT is kind of... At least for me and my friends it's kind of like the last step it's like we're all a little bit scared of it also in awe of it and i did ayahuasca last year for the first time and that was amazing and again dmt releases over 12 hours so you have some time for your body to prepare and to kind of acclimate <laughs> and puke if you need to all the things but when you take dmt straight it's like wait i think you said so with ayahuasca, you sorry, have. yes, with ayahuasca, you get 12 hours. It's a 12 hour situation, whether you want it to or not. And DMT itself, if you take it straight, it's about a whole it's I think the whole journey is about 15 minutes in this dimension. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's very important to say, because in other dimensions, it's timeless. And I would say that you get about two months of I my friend jokingly say it's it's kind of like downloading a zip drive from the universe. So you get like so much information in your body and in your conscious 
like it's conscious and subconscious. And then it takes about two months for it to unpack for most people. And when you take it, it's like the sensations for me, because you were saying you didn't blast off, right? So the difference, yeah. Well, I you did. did I would you? say I experienced a blast off. Basically, I started like my whole field of vision turned red before I even finished inhaling. Wow. So it was like very instantaneous. Um, and I had an actual sensation of lifting like on like a like an elevator almost mm-hmm. so i think that i would say i blasted off for sure but um <laughs> i remained in contact with my your body my body so i didn't i don't know did you lose track of your body when you were doing it yes yeah yeah like the sensation i had was and someone warned me that this would happen so it's like it feels like the engines of an airplane's like and it gets louder and louder and louder and then i heard a pop and i literally left my body and I was like, okay, we're gone. And I did it twice. And the first time Jasmine didn't give me that much, like more than you, but not enough to have a very long trip. Also, my dog was in my trip, my first one, which I love, Afro. Uh-huh. So we call it, started calling her Astro Afro. And then the second time I did it on the same day, um, yeah, I had no control over what was happening. I was like definitely in a different dimension. And I remember I kept opening my eyes and Jasmine was like, telling me later that also my best friend jasmine is like we keep talking about her she's like a goddess if you guys don't know her she's amazing um so she was telling me later that you should kind of just keep your eyes closed and like let it happen and i think my body was very you know i've had a lot of trauma so i needed to feel safe and so i think my body was doing this thing where it was like trying to connect me back to my body and i was very gone so I kept opening my eyes and like seeing geometric shapes on everything and like the auras of everything. And it was basically like my trip was overlaid in Nathan's villa in Wenom. And it was so beautiful. But anyways, I don't know why we started talking about that. I want you to, you tell me, what do you want to talk about today? We love D- uh, DMT is amazing. <laughs> and I love that. I just also <laughs> want to say one more thing that we're sitting in my best friend's Rosanna's apartment in Lisbon. And I like was like, you want some mushrooms? And she's like, no. So she had, we just made Michaela a cup of coffee on this very nice espresso machine. Thank you, it's Rosanna. It's a cappuccino, cappuccino with oat milk, of course. Yes, very hipster. And then I had some microdose of mushrooms. So so we might be on slightly different wavelengths. But we'll find each other in the middle. It's great. Totally. So what do you want to talk about, my dear? Well, who are we talking to? I guess. That's a good question. I mean, for me, this podcast is for all of the sensitive souls like us who are waking up or who are already awake and are trying to find their way safely back into their bodies. Mm -hmm. And they want to have a voice of something different, you know, like another option outside of what I call the matrix, which is like the nine to five, wake up, go to work. And all of that stuff and to talk about, yeah, Copenhagen and the society we're building there and all of the beautiful things that are in the world and that it's not, it's okay to be a sensitive soul. And that's actually what consciousness is going towards and that, yeah, we need to like just take care of each other. Why are you smiling? I'm smiling because I like how we started like straight with the DMT (laughs) trip and now it's like, wait, who are we? (laughs) Who are we? What are we doing? I'm wearing my lion pants. That's great. (laughs) Yeah, and kind of in like a dead bug position on a beanbag (laughs) chair right now. (laughs) I love it. Okay. So maybe you got, you were on a podcast and then got messages from some people asking you where your podcast was, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I started like, we were just talking about this, like, what should we name this? What should I name this? Because... I started, I've had many companies over the years and many brands and I just kind of got super tired of it. Like, so I started at something called Remote Collective, which was wanting to wake people up to that there was something outside of the nine to five. So that was kind of like me going from the corporate world, being (laughs) working in, in the law firm for six years to we can work remotely. So I had a YouTube channel where I interviewed people about working remotely, specifically women. And I was trying to in, encourage them. And then a lot of that just, especially with COVID, like when the world fell apart, I was just like, none of this matters. Like what? And then I just started really connecting to my spirituality and connecting to myself. And 
Mm-hmm. And that is where this kind of came from because Faraday was like, I started doing play parties. Oh, there's so much to say. There's so much to and where, say. What is the real question? Okay. So I started this because a friend has a podcast. He put me on his podcast. A lot of people from around the world reached out and said, where's your podcast? And then I realized, okay, I'm ready to start sharing my transmission to the world. And I feel... So inspired. I'm on a European tour. I stayed in Thailand for all of COVID. So almost three years I was there. I didn't really have a normal lockdown. We didn't have COVID on the island for like the first year. And so we lived in this very bubble of paradise. And like the whole world was just like melting and falling apart. And everyone's nervous systems having such a hard time. Mm-hmm. And now I'm out seeing all my friends, all of you guys. And I've been meeting all of these amazing people, especially like younger people who are just kind of like, I don't want to do what everyone else is doing, but I don't know another option. And right. So that's why I feel like this is a good, this is why I need to do this podcast is for all of them to say, yes, there is another option. Yeah. It's interesting because the people, I mean, if we're talking about people who are in their early to mid twenties, that's mm-hmm. kind of the same age that. You were when you were like, uh, time to leave the quote unquote matrix, i.e. a nine to five office job. And what I feel like you were looking for then was just autonomy to move around the world Mm -hmm. and not be locked into a very specific schedule and not be locked into a specific place. Um, And that was really great and really important, I think, in an mm-hmm. exploration that you did for several years. But it's not the end-all, be-all, because you can change where you live. You can change your work schedule, but oh, it doesn't necessarily change the fact that you're still kind of like plugged in and working and this is not to (laughs) belittle anyone's work or to say that maybe it would be totally satisfying just to change your work schedule up. But your transmission now is just like, Hey, it's a lot more or like finding that autonomy. I think that like quest for freedom, like personal freedom is gone like a lot deeper than just changing where you live. Yeah. I mean, people would always tell me like, okay, so remote work, digital nomads, it's all about the freedom. And I was, I just wanted to like punch them in the face. I was like, I don't, like it just didn't resonate with me. And then what I realized was it wasn't about freedom. It was the fact that I really believe at a core level, and this is something I've always been awake to, is that we create our reality. And people are like, well, what does that mean? You know, it's such a foreign concept for most people because we're so programmed to believe that we have to do X, Y, and Z to get whatever, whatever, whatever we want. Mm Mm-hmm. And I just knew from a young age, I was like intuitively like, no, I I think there's something better. Like we can have whatever we want as long as we believe in it. And so I would just kind of like in micro steps, you know, change different things of my life, sometimes very drastically. And then I would get what I wanted. And it was like over and over again, I proved to myself that if I believed in myself enough and I chose this certain timeline that I was able, I call it timelines, which is like. And when I imagine ourselves in our lives, like we have unlimited amounts of different things that we could be doing and different timelines that we could live out. And we choose which ones we want to go down by different decisions we have and mostly by our belief system. And I really believe that what we believe is our reality gets reflected back. So it's not our reality happens and then we are like, oh, okay, so this is what's happening. It's like, no, 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 we create it in our brain and then that gets reflected out externally in the 3D. And this is what we were just talking about earlier when we were having coffee. It's like, there's so much more than this 3D dimension that we have. And like, that is what I find fascinating. That's what I want to talk about. Like, how do we start playing that game? Because for me, it's the most fun part is, you know, I've always been awake, whether I wanted to or not from a very young age and also been very sensitive. And so because of that most of the time I'm like very overwhelmed by everything Mm -hmm. just from a somatic experience somatic is like the sensations that are happening in your body so from a somatic experience I was just so overwhelmed and I was like the world can be so much better why are we not doing anything about it and then to finally feel safe enough to drop into my body that's when I started to really create my reality and I was like wow this is the fun part of the game because I'm not scared anymore you know like I can do whatever I want to do 
And now I want everyone around me to start feeling awake and also embodied because mm -hmm. I want them to play the game with me. I think everyone can wake up and also feel safe to play the game. But there may be some steps along the way they need to learn. And I hope that this podcast can help them with that. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> I <have to> <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, so much to say. I get so juicy about it. I just, yeah, there's so much. Yeah. I mean, do you want to go more into any particular element like I think it's interesting when you're talking about the feeling of safety in your body mm -hmm. and like for me okay so I live in New York City most of the time and mm -hmm. I feel like even environmentally that kind of stimulation dissociates you from your body but I don't think it's just unique to New York I think it's like the whole way we're taught and raised to like communicate with our body mm -hmm. is kind of like cut off basically. For sure. I think so. I've done a lot of trauma awareness training recently and I minored in psychology in school because, you know, I grew up in it. Oh, I feel like I need to like give oh people like a timeline because there's so much. There's so much. And it's so like there's like the th again, the 3D reality, if you want to call yeah. it, of like where were you in the world what year was it yeah what actually happened and then there's the sort of like the spiritual, spiritual world of like yeah. what did what unlocked for you and like what did it do in your timeline yeah and so maybe we'll start help me <laughs> okay um gosh i feel like you're probably going to unpack every step of your journey through all the different podcasts yeah. yeah, like each episode, I assume there'll be something comes up and it'll go deeper into certain aspect or story or time of your life when it mm -hmm. or or whoever you're talking to. Um, but I guess I want to just do like an overview from like, oh, do you want to go all the way back to childhood or do you want to? I can give a quick, a quick replay and then maybe go deeper if you think it's better. Because I can say it all in like five minutes. Like yeah, people your, ask me all the time. Give your This is one bio. thing was I was on this retreat with all these amazing people in Austria. I love all of you guys. Um, a lot of them were asking like, I would just drop this thing. Like, yeah, I used to work in law. I used to, and they're like, how are you? I'm 32 now. And they're like, how are you this? How, what? <laughs> like none of this adds up to da da da. So I was born in California. Uh, I was raised as one of Jehovah's Witnesses, which I consider a cult. Uh, and the reason why I consider that is because when you want to leave, you are not allowed to leave. And if you choose to leave, my whole family will not. Sp my whole family is not allowed to speak to me. So most people cannot wrap their brains around that. That I have a family that very much loves me, and they're not allowed to speak to me. And I have not spoken to my dad in maybe ten years, and I haven't spoken to my mom in maybe two years, but like I haven't like really been in contact with my mom in a way that is like, you know, loving back and forth for like five or no, I mean, I've been out since for eight years now. Wow. Okay. So long time. So I was raised both sides of my family, Jehovah's Witnesses, all the way back to my great grandparents. So imagine being <laughs> like a cult in California where we were raised that like everyone around us is, we call it of the world. So they are not, they're, they are not safe people only the people that are safe are the people in the religion and then also my parents choosing to put me into a public school which is I found out later one of the top 10 public schools in all of California so very good education very open-minded and they I wasn't allowed to watch tv but I could read whatever I wanted so and this is also a, a glitch in in the, in the programming because mostly they wouldn't la allow you to read books but my dad really liked to read so he allowed me to do it so I would go to the library and I would literally read one book a day because mm -hmm. I wanted to know what the outside world was like and I wasn't allowed to talk to them or see them. I'd only see the people at school. I wasn't allowed to hang out with them after school. On top of this, my dad was very, very abusive, um, mostly emotionally and mentally. And then when I got into high school, it became physical. And then I graduated high school. I skipped a couple grades. I took a lot of you know university classes in high school. So I graduated high school at around 16. And um, my dad would tell me that I had to stay living with him or he would call the cops on me. 
because I and I at the time I didn't know in the states we call it emancipation, which means that you can go and legally separate yourself from your parents and say, "Hey, I'm an adult now," or whatever. I didn't know how to do that, so I just stayed at home in this very abusive situation. And then I finally told my mom, "If you don't leave him, I will stay until I'm 18, but I'm never going to talk to either of you again." And then she ended up like moving because he was also really abusive to her, and she just like was so programmed by the religion. Like in the religion, you're not allowed to get divorced unless someone cheats on someone or someone dies and so like she literally had the people in the church telling her she wasn't allowed to leave even though he was being like beating her up and being really abusive so finally she left and told us to pack our bags for two weeks we went up to Oregon the state above California and stayed with my grandparents and I never I never went back home and then from there I went and like lived with a couple of people and I got married when I was 18 and at the same like it's like so many timelines happening at once so I got married And, um, at the same time I decided that I wanted to put myself through school, which was, wasn't, it wasn't technically illegal in the religion, but it was like a very negative thing. Like you were, like I had to hide it that I was going to university. I'm saying university in the States, we call it college, whatever, whatever. And I, because I did so well in school, I tested out of the first two years of my university, my undergraduate degree. And then I put myself through law school. So I was <laughs> going to all these like volunteer things during the day, being a very good church girl, being a housewife, also 18, working at Starbucks, <laughs> which is also just random. And then at nighttime, I went to school full time. So I did all of those things all at once. And at the same time, I, we moved to Salt Lake City, Utah, because that's where my ex-husband was from. So I lived in like Mormonville in in Jehovah's Witness community and was going to school for to be a lawyer at night and it was just like I was so depressed that I was on antidepressants and I felt so unsafe in so many ways because I didn't feel safe in my religion of course because at any moment anyone can like you know report you and you can get kicked out and no one will talk to you and then we I was in the community that my ex-husband had grown up in so it was like all of his uncles and his dad they all ran the church so it (laughs) I was really the outsider there Mm -hmm. and then I was so depressed I was just like I got to point I couldn't get out of bed and I was like the only time I was overweight in my whole life and I finally got a really good therapist which ironically was also Jehovah's Witness but he lived in New York City and we did Skype therapy and it took him I think in a way like the universe had these people placed to kind of help me get out you know like even though he was a Jehovah's Witness it was the only way I was allowed to do therapy was because he was a witness Mm. But he helped me to realize that my life and my personal rights were just as important as the men around me because, you know, women were not allowed to have a lot of rights in the religion. And so I was really proud of myself that at 24, after six years of marriage, and I knew I didn't want to be married after year one, I stayed for five more years, um, that I sat my ex-husband down and I said, I don't want to be married anymore. I don't, I, I don't have anyone on the side. I'm not cheating on you. I just like, I can't do this, you know? And he was like, I do not accept this. And he just started screaming, throwing things and, and just kind of went crazy. And I, <laughs> um, we separated and then my, I wanted to get divorced right away. And my therapist was like, why don't you give it six months just to let it settle for him? Like, I know, you know what you want to do, but let him settle. So I did that and I, I got placed in a law firm at 18. I had a job placement program from the government. They helped me cause I, I don't know. I, don't, I think the universe was always helping me. So I had already had this job in a, a very good law firm. So at 24, I was making like almost double what my ex-husband was. And I, and I think in a way I kind of did that to help myself get out. And then one month after I did file for divorce, because I worked in a law firm, it was like the fastest divorce ever. So it took like two weeks for it to process. I did this, uh, I did a something where I could expedite it, da, da, da. And I just gave him everything, gave him the house. I ended up taking on whatever debt. I was like, I don't care. I just want to get out. And another thing to know is that in the religion, even though we were divorced in, in the government's side, in a spiritual sense within the religion, he would never be able to be remarried unless I died or I cheated on him. So, and I was like, fuck that. I want to be completely separated from you. So I had a friend who wasn't a witness and I slept with him. And I went back and I told the religious leaders, okay, I slept with someone else. And they were like, 
usually what happens is they kind of give you like a slap on the wrist and they're like, okay, here's a private reproof. Don't do it again, whatever, whatever. They like, you know, because it was my ex-husband's family, they like met with each other. 10 minutes later, they came back and they said, okay, we're going to like, they call it disfellowshipping, which means they kick you out of the church. You have one week to tell your family goodbye. We're going to kick you out next week. And I was like, what? And so my mom came to the last church meeting where I was Jehovah's Witness and she cried the whole way through because she knew I was going to get kicked out. And then they make an announcement from the platform with like 150 people there. And they're like, Brittany Bond is no longer one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And from that moment on, I was a ghost. Like everyone walked right by me. They were not allowed to speak to me. My whole family was not allowed to speak to me. And I was just kind of like, fuck all of this. I moved to Costa Rica. So mm -hmm. like, this is where I'm saying like jumping timelines. Cause I, for many years with, even though I was still married, I always wanted to work remotely. I was like, okay, let's work remotely. My, my, I can just bring him with me. We can live anywhere. And so I helped many law firms go paperless. I figured out like in, internally consulting to help them go paperless. And then I moved to Costa Rica and I had never lived in a foreign country by myself. I'd never been to Costa Rica and I just found this kind of like co-living type of space that I thought had Wi-Fi. When I got there, they didn't have Wi-Fi. So I was just like living below this surf town um, in Tamarindo, Costa Rica, where I was just running around like this crazy person just trying to find Wi-Fi everywhere in a surf town where it was just like guys. Like I was like really the only girl I knew that was like me that was like living completely, you know, self-sufficiently on her own. And also the only person I knew around that was working remotely. Like did, the term digital nomad at the time did not exist. And I, di I just didn't know anyone like me. So I did that for a couple months and then and then I think the I had a breakdown, which is, you know, spiritual awakening slash mm -hmm. breakdown where, yeah, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say in terms of the timeline, Costa Rica is like 2012, 2014, 2014. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So then I moved to, so I ended up quitting my job, uh, even though they wanted me to keep working with me. I just like couldn't work. I was just crying was all the, the time. in Salt Lake. Yes, City. in Salt Lake. Yeah. And then I ended up renting a car and traveling all around Costa Rica and Nicaragua in Panama, just like, you know, living my best life, just like flowing and figuring out. And I would meet all these women along the way that were like 18, I'm 24. And I was just like, let's go to a waterfall. And I pile them all in my car and they're backpacking through on a budget. And I was so inspiring for them because they just thought, oh, I didn't know that people could do that like this. And I just had this feeling like I want to start a company that can inspire women to travel because I, it was so empowering for me, but I knew that I needed to go back into what I call the matrix and make as much money as I can to, in order to figure out how to, I needed to have like a safe zone because my money was running out. And so I moved to what I figured it was the place that can make the most amount of money, New mm -hmm. York city. This is where I met you Yep. and got the highest paying law firm job I could find. And then with, um, through friends, I found some people who were starting a startup of similar to one that I wanted to do, which was, we take people who work remotely, they already have their own jobs and we do a country a month around the world. And so we do like pop-up co-living locations and they wanted to, I wanted to do it only for women. They were like, okay, well, most of the people working remotely are men. So maybe we can just do like one pop-up for women, but let's do this. So I partnered with them and I stayed in New York city while they were launching, we were launching the company and they went all the way through South America. I had just done that. So I was like, yeah, cool. And then, um, I, par I came on the trips starting when they came to Portugal, which is funny because now we're in Portugal. Mm -hmm. So this is 20. So I was in New York from 2015 to 2016. And then I, I just like couldn't stand New York. Like mm -hmm. I and it was so stressed out. I got shingles. If people don't know what that is, it's like nerve damage. It's like adult chicken pox and, I was on morphine and I remember I already had scheduled this trip to go to Greece. It's a holiday to go to Greece. And when two days into my holiday, I didn't need the morphine pills anymore. And I'm like, okay, so I need to get the fuck out of New York. Like this is just mm -hmm. because I'm just really stressed. And so came on the trip with them um, starting in July of that year. I remember I feel like I went to your July 4th um party fourth of july party yeah and then i got on the plane like when the fireworks were going off 
Yeah. That was amazing. And then, (laughs) and then I traveled around all of Europe with the group. Like I would go ahead of time and find like a new country, like Croatia, Italy, and find the places. And then we went into Asia and this is where you also came. uh, Cause I stayed and I went, I went to Chiang Mai and I stayed in Chiang Mai and I really liked it. And then you came out and we stayed there for three months together and I kind of just fell in love with Thailand. I think I thought that the rest of the world, or lost it, the rest of Asia was like Thailand. So I remember the guy I was dating at the time, Oz, we kept traveling all over Asia after that. And I was just like, nope, Thailand is the place. And I even, mm-hmm. he had a job in San Francisco that we needed to onboard, even though it was remote. So we even came all the way back to San Francisco and then went through Europe again. And then that next year in 2017, I landed in Thailand and I was like, okay, I think this is going to be my home base. And the place that, oh, back up. The place that we were c- working out of was the co-working space in Chiang Mai called Pun Space, which was like the main one. And they didn't have any events. It was like the main one that everyone knew and they didn't have any events. So I said, we need to, I'm randomly doing a coding boot camp because my ex was into coding. And I'm like, we need a place to do our coding boot camp. Can I exchange it for doing events for you? And they were like, yeah, sure. And so I just ran the events for one month. They loved it so much that they were like, can you keep doing this? I'm like, yeah, but you got to pay me. So then we worked out a deal. I think they had to pay me almost $2,000 a month to like do just a couple events there and like run the community. Yeah. So then the startup that you had gotten yourself involved with what, like after you left New York and you were just sort of like Mm -hmm. moving ahead, eventually that dissolved, right? No, they're still going. Not, not, but you're part of it. Oh yeah. It very much blew up in my face. Let's just (laughs) put that out there because I started it as co-founders with them and then Uh they took everything that I did and all the marketing, everything that I I just did everything. And then they were like, actually, we don't think that you are a co-founder. We think that you actually need to invest money to be. And I was just like, wow, you don't realize that I like used to work in law for six years and our company started our company was incorporated in the states and they're both german so i got very upset and uh they ended up buying me out of my percentage of the company Mm -hmm. and it's really funny because to this day like i'm not even going to mention the company now because to this day every time i mention it they're like she's not a co-founder and i'm like you don't even realize that like me putting my name associated with you is actually a good thing yeah (laughs) so let's just say it was a travel company and it started the same year as remote year and it's very similar to remote year and blah 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 and it was a great experience it got me on the road and i'm very grateful to them for that and that you left before you came to Chiang Mai right yeah that kind of fell apart like in Europe at the mm-hmm. towards the end of the year and then I came to Chiang Mai and Oz and I started this coding boot camp because he used to do them in London and then we were doing them there and then I just fell in love with like running the community because that's what I loved about the travel company was yeah I would just wherever we go into a new country again digital nomads was such a new thing like us remote working they would put us on the news they put us on the radio they were like who are these crazy people like coming through from all these different countries Mm -hmm. and I would always consult the co-working spaces wherever we were so yeah I started doing that in Chiang Mai and really enjoyed it and then they ended up expanding to three different locations in the same city I started doing festivals there and then we had a um Bali Hubud is the co-working space in Bali and they had a co-working they call it like co-working unconference asia anyways it's a, a co-working conference for all the people who run co-working spaces around asia and they would travel around and do pop-ups in different countries so we hosted it that year in chiang mai mm-hmm. and again i don't know what i'm doing i'm just kind of like making stuff up and suddenly i have like 200 founders of co-working spaces from all over asia there with their teams and we're hosting them in Chiang Mai and they had the best time and all of them found out about me. And so they started asking me, can you come launch our community here? So then I started traveling around to different countries all over Asia, launching co-working spaces like I did it at Dojo in Bali. I did it in Vietnam and Malaysia. I just went around everywhere and, was, and India, they had me come out. They, they did the co-working conference the next year in India. But anyway, so that's how I started. I was very deep in the remote working digital nomad space for a long time. And it was just, for me, it was all about community. I really just Mm -hmm. loved bringing people together. And then, I don't know, I need help here. I'm kind of getting lost in all of this. It feels like a lot of words. I mean, we're just trying to (laughs) put your life, your three-dimensional life in a timeline. Okay, timelines. So Um, 
yeah so then this is okay go ahead so i wanted to start all the time i always wanted to empower women so i decided to make a women's festival in chiang mai um so i had we had like a ton of people come together like 300 women come Mm -hmm. and i invited everyone guys and girls could come but it was completely led and run by women Mm-hmm. So I did that and was running the co-working space. And then I started consulting at a, a consultancy firm based out of KL, which was doing like culture changes in large organi- organizations, agile, sprints, design thinking. So once one week out of every month, I would fly from Chiang Mai to Singapore or Hong Kong. And I would do like, <laughs> it was just so funny. I was like in my hippie villa in Chiang Mai, you know, like with all my friends. And then one, one week out of the month, I'm like in pencil skirts and high heels and just being very serious, pretending <laughs> to be serious <laughs> with like C-suites of these large, it was basically like, you know, the Coca-Cola of Asia or Singapore Airlines or something, some huge company. And we're talking to like the heads of the company about basically treat your employees better, allow them, give them access to remote work. Here's like a better way to run your teams. Because I was the whole time I'm like, how do we help people get out of the matrix? Like, Mm -hmm. and then I just got so frustrated by it because I was like, none of this is really changing anything. So, and so that whole, like, this is a span of time from the time you kind of left the States, started, you know, doing the co-working, co-living, moving into your own sort of launching co-working spaces mm-hmm. into all this consulting work mm-hmm. that was pretty much like what 2016 Six, to 2019 yeah. yeah so then january february of 2019 was this co-working conference they were taking it to india so i spent a month in india traveling around stayed with all the families of these people who own co-working spaces like hung out with their kids you know like really immerse myself in that version the middle class india i would say you know and just saw a lot of in southern india and really enjoyed it i spoke at the conference like the co-working space like bought me a sari and i was it was just so much fun i felt like it was like extended family you know Mm -hmm. and then in that moment i was dating someone who was a filmmaker for national geographic and so i asked him like do you want to make a tv show with me because the gap that i saw was like so many people were messaging me from all over the world saying i want to work remotely but my employer does not get it. They think I'm just going to be like the only media at the time was people on laptops on the beach in Bali. And like, let me tell you, I lived in Bali for many years or like off and on. Like I lived there for three months for many years. And um, you would never take your your laptop to the beach. Like, you know, like, no, like none of this is real. It's all just like fake stuff. And so I was like, I want to create a like a TV series of people showing what it's really like to work remotely and like the practical steps of like, this is how you do it. Something where I could, someone could take this video and show it to their boss and say, this is what it's really like to work remotely. Or I want to go work in that co-living space and like, like a very physical impression of like, this is how you do it. And this is what happens. So I raised a bunch of money, just, you know, just ask, ask companies, ask friends for sponsorship for a a TV show. And then we traveled all through Europe and top of Africa, staying at my friend's co-living spaces and then interviewing companies who like, you know, top companies like Eventbrite, Zoom and LinkedIn, all these companies. And we'd go and sit in their office and have them say, that they believed the remote work was best practice. Like I was trying to get them from a legal standpoint, my background's like set the precedence, like remote work, everyone should have access to remote work. I believe this Mm -hmm. is a right of everyone. And then the distribution of that was interesting because I just am like, this is, this is what people need to hear. I'm so fired up about it. Like everywhere I was going, I was like filming. We were just going on this little tour. It was really fun. Mm -hmm. Went for six months, (laughs) completely dissolved our relationship. Like we were fighting, my ex and I Mm -hmm. were fighting all the time because it was just so much pressure we were putting on ourselves. And now I look back and I'm like, what was the point? But then we put all of that on YouTube. And so this is again in 2019, one year before COVID. And then I went back to Thailand that fall and was very burnt out. And I just, I didn't know like what I was like, what was the point of any of it? You know, I just felt like I was like preaching 
to people who didn't really care that much or yeah I just didn't feel like it was clicking for me like I think this is when my spirituality was really like coming to the forefront it was like Mm -hmm. we need to go deeper than (laughs) the surface level remote work stuff and at the same time like my name was starting to get very well known like you know getting in like New York Times and and people from very big conferences were asking me to speak and like I was just so burnt out I was like what does it even matter? You know, like people from big consultancy firms were wanting to hire me and have basically use my name to promote remote work. And Mm -hmm. I just like didn't care anymore. And then that fall, I went to Copenhagen for the first time. My ex, the the next boy, I feel like there's, you know, like there's a whole other like timeline of of Britney's boyfriend relationships. (laughs) Britney's boyfriends. (laughs) 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 So the boyfriend I was dating at that time uh, took me to Copenhagen for my birthday in October and the fall of 2019. And then we were about to do a year, like a, you know, a tour around the world again. And so we started traveling again that January and I made it to five countries on three different continents before the world shut down. Mm -hmm. I flew to Singapore and then to New York to see you. And then I met Rosanna, who I'm in her apartment right now. We met up in Rio for Carnival and then went back to New York, was there for the last parties that were allowed before COVID. Oh boy. And then I flew from New York to Egypt because I was going to do a consultancy on like the Sahara and some like beautiful co-living space out in the desert. And when I was in the plane on my layover, we landed in Germany and I got informed that Egypt had closed their borders. And I was like, I felt like I was in a movie. I was like, yeah, what the <laughs> fuck? And then I was just like, called my boyfriend. I was like, he was still in Thailand. And I'm like, what do I do? And he's like, okay, well, we're, we were planning to go to Burning Man in South Africa the next month, which was basically, it's called Africa Burn. And he's like, well, let's go to, let's go to South Africa early. So I was going to South Africa because I was going to organize a conference for corporates around remote work. And then I was going to fuck off and go into the desert for two weeks and, and go to Burning Man in South Africa. And so we rerouted and we went down to, to Cape Town and I've been there two years, two years in a row before. So this is my third time in Cape Town. I love Cape Town. I have some good friends there and people and that COVID wasn't there yet. And then mm-hmm. the t- day two or three were there and I'm in the meeting about the conference that we're organizing and suddenly the people there are like, okay, so COVID's here. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Okay. And they're like, it's okay. We only have like 10 or 15 cases. And I'm like, no, mm-hmm. no, no, I've seen how this goes. And then, and then within a week they brought army trucks out into the streets and they were like pointing guns at people telling them to get inside. And I was like, no, 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 I'm not like, if people don't know, Cape town has one of the highest, um, rape per capita crime rate. And like, you know, our door for our, our apartment had like two or three layers of doors to get inside and like six, six locks on every door. And, and I was like, I'm not going to get locked inside of this inside of, you know, whatever is going to happen here, food shortages. They already had electricity shortages. So we made an executive decision to get on the plane and get the fuck back to Thailand. Cause for me, that was home. Again, my family doesn't talk to me. So there was no point of going back to California and I got there two days before, I didn't know this, but I could feel it that everything was about to lock down. And I got there two days before the country lockdown. And I remember being at the airport in Bangkok and there was literally no one. It's just a ghost town and Bangkok airport's very big. And the lady's like, you have to buy, you have to buy a plane ticket out of here. And I was like, what? And she's like, yeah, yeah. I mean, like technically you have to buy, you know, you're on a tourist visa right now. You have to buy a plane ticket out. And I was like, laughing i'm like okay yeah whatever whatever gets me in and so i bought a plane ticket knowing i was never going to get on that plane and then we got to copenhagen because if people don't know in the north they have what they call a burning season so they just burn all their crops one certain time of the year so i still had my house in chiang mai in the north and i was like all of my friends were on copenhagen because it was burning season so we went there and then two days later the (laughs) the whole country locked down the whole world locked down and my friend that I had messaged, I just put on Facebook, hey, we're coming. Does anyone have a place or whatever? And then a friend of mine was like, hey, I have a villa right on the beach um, with a couple of their friends. And we have a maid that comes and cooks and cleans for us so you can stay with us. And because you guys are a couple, we'll let you have the nice room right on the water. Totally manifested this place, by the way. I'm like really good at manifesting locations. Um, so we <laughs> went in there. And at the time, my ex and I knew that we were going to split up. Like we already decided we were going to break up. And 
then the world was falling apart. And so we were like, let's just stay together. We didn't tell anyone that we in the house that we had broken up. But then we started to tell people because, you know, we're all locked down together and no one knows what's going to go on. And then he fucking gets with one of the girls in the house, my friend who invited me. And then they collectively asked me to move out of the house, which I just find hilarious looking back because I think it was the universe that was just trying to help me move on from the situation. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up moving out and going and staying with another girlfriend of mine. And just, it was so good for me to get out of the situation. And then from there, just slowly meeting all of the community and started dating someone else who, um, him, he had the main co-working space on Copanyang. Co um, and then we made a community space because for us, we wanted to have a place that people could gather and like both of us were kind of over co-working. So we basically had a co-working space without the co-working. It's like all the events, right. the community <coughs> it was a three bedroom villa. I still have it on the island and we didn't realize it at the time, but the, the land that we, the land where the house is on is owned by the mayor of where we live. And the mayor, you need to know, in Thailand is also the mafia. And so, like, they kind of run everything on the island. And they were like, yeah, yeah, you can keep doing events, but you have to keep all your bikes inside and, like, make sure you hide everything. And so we did that. And we didn't have COVID on the island for the whole first year. So imagine the whole island is locked down. You can leave, but you can't come back. And we're just sitting there, like, taking shit tons of acid and just, like, you know, I don't know, living our best life. Like crypto was doing great. Like everyone, all my friends there were just like making millions of dollars on crypto. We had this huge villa. We did like parties every weekend with like 200 people. And then we had this community space where like even the yoga shalas, everything had to technically shut down because they had to follow the laws of the whole, like the regional laws of lockdown. But our community space, we were doing like two or three events a day with like 40 people because, and it was the hub. It was like where everyone came and hung out. And then, yeah. Do you have any sense of how many people were locked down on the island with you? Um, I would say like people, like a lot of people got really scared and they left. So I think, no, I really am bad at numbers, but I would say like in, within our Facebook group, we have a thousand people for Copenhagen that are active on the island. And then our, our WhatsApp, we have over 300 people. Mm -hmm. So probably about that many at least yeah. are active within a, my community. I think there's probably, you know, probably 10 times more that people on the island. So maybe 10,000 people. The island to drive from the top to the bottom is like 45 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's not very big. Um, and then of course there's the whole Thai community. And what I love is because the island itself is a touristy island. A lot of people think of it as like they know it for on the full moon, they do these full moon parties. But I live on the other side of the island. There's no full moon parties where I live. And we live in like a very beautiful nature area. And because there wasn't any tourists for two years, like all the Thai people and the Burmese people that live there, we all became integrated with each other. Like I have so many Thai mamas that like check on me and like go water my plants when I'm not home. They feed my dog. Like they love me. And like even when I'm away, they're always checking on me. And to me, that's that's what home is, is like where you really feel like I belong here. And when I'm not here, people miss me. To me, that's what belonging is. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I traveled, I've been to over 50 countries, maybe 60 now on this trip. I did we went a couple more. I don't know. I don't really care about the numbers, but I, w I traveled everywhere because I think subconsciously I was looking for a place to call home and yeah. also for a community to call home because they say our biggest heartaches are the biggest gifts that we can give the world. And like when I tell people my story about like my, the fact that like my sisters and my mom, like I'm so close to them and they won't speak to me anymore. And it's like, most people cannot cognitively, you know, hold that in their brain and in their emotional body. Mm -hmm. And for me, the only way that I can like transmute that is to go and, and create community because I know what it feels like to not belong. Mm -hmm. So that's like, that's like one layer of my reality that's happened in the last couple of years. I feel like there's so <laughs> many more layers. Also like when I started doing psychedelics, that's a whole other layer. But yeah, what, what, else, what do you think? I think that was a really useful overview of how you got to where you are because it's like the story is like a movie it's like who lives this life <laughs> honestly I guess I maybe some of the other nomads live crazy lives like this but it's pretty unusual mm -hmm. um life story and I think yeah again people are like wait what it sounds like you're making stuff up if you just hear one piece of it you're like wait what um so I think that was very 
probably useful. Did and I next time anything? someone asks you to tell your whole life story, just be like, it's like 45 minutes on this. Oh my God. Did I talk for 45 minutes? Wow. We're at 48. Well, we spent the first 10 talking about our DMT trip. Yeah. And this is the thing is like, for me, I don't live in my past. I really live in the present and the mm-hmm. now. And so like when people ask me, I understand that it is important because it can help other people. Like there's so much of what I went through from a somatic, from, you know, body, body experiencing perspective mm-hmm. that helps me be who I am today. So I, this is also why this is important because I want to get it out there. I want to, sh- if it can in- help other people, I want to inspire them to, you know, live their full authentic selves. Yeah. But I, I don't go around being like my ex-husband, you know, he tried to kill himself twice when, when we, and he, the second time he told me it was my fault. Mm-hmm. And I was just like, I could sit there and be traumatized by that. Or I could be like, yeah, that's something that happened. And I let it go. And I still love him. And I still like, you know, send him good energy. And I hope he, I hope he heals himself. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, yeah. I don't let it, it's not like a moment in time that holds me down. It's yeah. like, I'm still flowing forward. Like there's so much momentum going yeah. forward that sometimes it's hard to even talk about the past. Right. So I think that giving that trajectory really gives a lot of context to what you had experienced when you let, when you kind of got locked down mm-hmm. for two years, because I feel like those two years of lockdown were transformative in like a different way, or maybe it's all part of, it's all part of the same journey, but it's sort of like next level. Yeah. I mean, I didn't realize how much I was running. Like yeah. I think, Maybe I was even running away from a lot of the pain from, you know, losing my family and all this stuff. And like, it was like, if I could just, (laughs) they say, I keep saying this to you, trauma, Jasmine always tells me trauma is too much too fast. And I think I really was like from a somatic experience level, it was just running like new country, new community. It's like, I almost was like, how much can I do in the 3D? Mm -hmm. But the, in the spiritual world in my body, it was like, hi, hey, hey, we're Mm -hmm. here too. We want to experience. So when I got to the island, when I moved out from that villa with my ex, I got my only ever scooter accident and I got dengue all at once. So if you don't know what dengue is, it's like malaria. It's like from a mosquito biting you, but they call it the bone breaking disease because Mm -hmm. I've had COVID and it's worse than COVID. And I, I couldn't even function. I, my, it messes with your brain. So like I, I was physically sick from the, the scooter accident, mentally and, you know, also physically sick from, from dengue. And I remember talking to some of my mentors and I was like, they were like, when was the last time you didn't work for a month? And I just started crying because I didn't feel, I was in such survival mode, such hustler mode. Like if I was like, I didn't feel safe enough to slow down. Like the last time I didn't work was when I lived at home, you know? Yeah. And it's because I don't have anyone to fall back on. I mean, I, now I do. Now I have a community. Now I have a crew. Now I have family, soul mm-hmm. family. I, I call them chosen family. But, but back then, even, even you know, in 2020, I didn't feel that. I, d- I felt like, okay, if I run out of money, I'm going to be homeless. And I right. can't, that is not an option. Yeah. I mean, I think it's good to recognize that for anybody who is also... I mean, like you have that instinct, that impulse of like, I want something more than this, like, Mm -hmm. but you don't have a sense of security or safety, like just to, um, acknowledge that (laughs) even like for you, it's like those fears and those anxieties were there. So it's not like, I mean, you are amazing, but I'm just saying that like, you also dealt with a lot of like insecurities and fears and it wasn't like every step of the way was just like easy breezy. (laughs) For sure. I think it, I needed to go through that like hitting rock bottom in order to actually have trust in the universe and trust in myself and my body. But yeah, for all of those, it's from 2014 to 2020. So six years of just running, traveling nonstop, sometimes a country a week, country a month. Mm -hmm. I had a very high level of anxiety running through me and no one really knew it. Only my partner, only my boyfriend, whoever the boyfriend was at the time. And I realized we even talked about this. Like, I think I always had a boyfriend at my side. Like Rosanna jokingly calls me Kim Kardashian. because She's like, literally every time I see you online on social media, you had a new boyfriend, you know, and they're always like very good looking and very tall and all these things. But I think that it was because I didn't feel safe and I needed to, I I almost wanted someone to physically be around me to create that experience of safety because I had such a feeling of unsafety in my body. Right. And then when I went through that 
kind of rock bottom on the island slash spiritual spiritual awakening, um, I started to allow myself to open up Mm -hmm. and allow myself to drop into my body and then allow community, allow chosen family to show up for me. Mm -hmm. So healing. Yeah. So the rock bottom being like global lockdown plus scooter accident plus dengue fever plus what happened to your work at that time like did you just sort oh, of I, I had the most work I ever had mm-hmm. and I could do none of it like I really couldn't function I couldn't think I couldn't so I ended up having to turn down a lot of it because mm-hmm. yeah I just couldn't I couldn't do it like I was working 12 hours a day when like everyone was freaking out thinking the world was ending and I was sitting there on my computer for 12 hours a day for the first like six months until I moved out of this place and had all that stuff happen yeah and how long were you kind of in that physically <laughs> rock bottom <laughs> i don't know what to call it i think i went for about two months oh my god one month hardcore long time. yeah yeah one month hardcore and then one month like coming back to myself but there was a good like couple weeks where i would wake up in the morning and just listen to classical music and just cry for like half the day yeah. Because it was like, I think my, I think my nervous system was finally like feeling safe enough to wake up again. Like it wasn't like, I wasn't completely no- numbing it. Mm-hmm. And so it was just so raw and so sensitive. And this is also when I realized like, oh my God, I am, you know, what they call it highly sensitive person. I think that's bullshit. I think I'm just like human and like allowing myself to feel all of my emotions mm-hmm. and yeah, just dropping into my body. But then one thing that I realized on this trip, I really want to say before I forget is I, I think on the Island, there's so much spiritual and healing modalities. And I I tried a lot of them and they all helped me in different ways. And the recipe that really helped me, I'm looking at my wrist right now because I made these bracelets and, um, they say safe home and joy. And for me, that is the recipe for me to be able to drop into my body. So to feel safe in my body or th- for me to really be my authentic self, I think that's a better way to say it, to feel safe in my body first, to feel at home, like wherever I'm at, I feel at home. So like, which, like feel at home in myself my and like with my people, with my tribe. And then from that, I'm able to emanate what is my authentic core, which is joy, you know? Mm-hmm. And this is one thing, like so many people, <laughs> when I tell people my story, they're like, they're almost angry for me. Like it's like they want me to be angry because I had a hard quote unquote hard life. Yeah. And then I say to them, but no, I choose joy. Like what is the point of having all these things happen? If you're not going to just turn around and be like, but there's something better than this. You know, like if anything, I have reached the depths of hell because I can come and tell you that it's not really that big of a deal. (laughs) (laughs) Or you don't have to get stuck in hell. Yeah. Just don't get stuck in it. It's like, like I learned all, I I feel like I learned all the lessons that I was supposed to learn. And if I didn't, I'll learn them again. It'll come back around in different ways. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I feel like I learned a lot and I was able to be more heart open and more receptive. Like the thing on this trip, like traveling around Europe for a couple of months is like, Oh my God, I love all of my friends. And mm-hmm. it's just like also just being my bubbly Copanyang self, like the world reflects back to me that joy that I give out, you know, mm-hmm. like whether it's in a coffee shop or the taxi driver, people are just like talking to me nonstop and like giving me things and just wanting to make sure I have a good trip. And it's yeah. because from the inside, I'm reflecting this joy and I'm so happy for it. Yeah. I know it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot, but there's so much I like still, I feel like I could just keep asking you questions forever. I mean, I don't care how long these are. People can just turn it off. Uh, yeah, it. true. I was like thinking about after you came out of your like dengue fever mm-hmm. it, and you had to turn down a lot of work. Mm-hmm. Um, at some point, like when you, was there a moment when you were coming out that there was one healing modality or workshop or something that kind of gave you your first, I don't know, handhold out. Do you yeah. remember? Yeah, yeah. We had a women's circle on the island. So what that means is like a, a girlfriend of mine, the one I went and stayed with, she knew a girl that her name's Danielle. And she was like, I want to have women meet together once a week and just whatever we want to do together. But we have one hour together where we can drop in and everyone can have a, a moment to share like five or 10 minutes of sharing. And then, just have tea or just hang out and just be girls together 
I didn't know any of the women. And um, so I did that when I first got out of the villa I was living in. I started meeting with them. And then when I got dengue, they all completely showed up for me, you know, like, and again, this is a moment where you're feeling the most vulnerable. And at one point I couldn't even get out of bed and they all just came into bed with me and they just were like coming, cuddling with me, making me tea, like lighting incense, just cleaning my house for me. Mm -hmm. And I was just like crying. I was just like, just like crying a lot. And it was so connecting me to my heart. And to me, that is again, communities where when you leave or you're missing, people feel like they mi- they miss you like you really belong and like mm-hmm. they would move the the women's circle to my house like we would be like we're just gonna do it at Brittany's house mm-hmm. so then I didn't have to leave that week and I could just come and hang out with them mm-hmm. and that's like the core of again why I feel like community is so important I think that is the recipe for everything because as humans oh this is something I really want to say and I'm going to say this on probably almost every podcast I do is When you are a baby, so I learned this in my trauma awareness course, when you are a baby from zero to three years old, you cannot regulate your own nervous system. And so that's why when babies cry, they call it co-regulation because the parents put them on their chest and the baby feels the heartbeat and they line up their heart with their parents' heart. So that's co-regulation. So that's also why you get imprinted with your parents' nervous system, whatever fucked upness they have. <laughs> and you have to like unlearn that or whatever. But as adults, we act like we don't need co-regulation. Like this is what we're programmed to believe. Right. But it's not true. We need constant co-regulation, which can be holding each other's hand, touching each other. And this is in non-sexual ways. This is just care. I call it caring touch. It's like I'm here. We are here together. And from a somatic experience, from your body's unconscious experience, it's it's you feeling like you're dropped into the tribe and that you're safe Mm -hmm. and we need this constantly. And then as, as, as like people in the matrix and out here in the world, we are programmed to believe that you have to put all of that caring touch, all of that connection into the box of sexuality or Mm -hmm. with your romantic partner, like one person, you know, Mm -hmm. and maybe your girlfriends, if you're a woman, like, you know, you can be a little bit more affectionate with each other, but it's like, as humans, we need this constantly. And this is what I love about Koh Panyang. It's like, I feel like as a community, this is kind of an accepted thing. Like people give each other hugs all the time. Everyone's cuddling all the time. And we're just constantly dropped. I mean, you were there. How was it for you? Uh, it was a bit of a culture shock, but in a really good way, in a really eye-opening way. I mean, I felt like I, by the end of it, had discovered this literal hidden magic you know like i was like oh the magic spell to so many problems is just human touch like literal contact um and i again i was coming from new york coming out of lockdown so i feel like lockdown in new york especially was like must have been rough uh, right like you got to keep that six foot bubble as much as possible for like I don't even know what that means. Like to yeah, me, that's it, like, I don't even know. I don't even want to know. Oh, well, <laughs> it like, just means g- grab a broom handle and like <laughs> swing around in a circle and make sure there's no one in that area. I'm <laughs> Just kidding. But yeah, but like for, you know, months that became sort of the re- more than months. I feel like it was like at least a year, you know, it took so long. It was so that's long. That's like what most of the world went through, right? Yeah, I probably varied in every place. New York got hit particularly bad. And so like people, my friends, we were all very careful. We would wait two weeks before seeing each other, like testing, like uh, it was it was rough. So there was like I was on extra low contact, like even like hugs, hello or goodbye were kind of like there's an anxiety there of like, OK, we're getting close to each other. And you could, yeah, you basically parse out the time you would spend with each other Mm -hmm. um two weeks apart basically so that you could make sure if you caught it you wouldn't spread it to someone else wow um so it was like really low contact and um i kind of forgot that all of us went through that like there was like a collective isolation going on because by by 2022 when i came in may things kind of felt normal. They kind of feel normal in New York again. Like, yeah. How do you feel like your body is processing that? 
processing the isolation. Yeah. Do you feel like it? there is stuff to be processed or do you think you just allowed it to move through you? Because I'm just wondering is like, is there stuck stuff in your body from that? That's what trauma is, just stuck energy in your body. Yeah, I think. Well, I think I well in talking about Thailand and going to Koh Phangan, I feel like I had this really nice eye opening, you know, somatic experience where at first I was just weirded out to be honest I was like oh my you thought god we were crazy. everyone's a hippie and no offense <laughs> I love hippies and I identify I mean you know sort of the it is just unusual to see such a long hug and people would like <laughs> greet each other it happened to me too. Like I met some strangers, like your friends, and they would just give me like long hugs. Did it make you uncomfortable? At first it did because I was like, wait, what? Did it feel fake? Or did no, it-, it didn't feel fake. It, I was just my, I was, un, my body was unreceptive to it. It was like okay. danger, like probably. Danger, Will like, a, a Danger. I mean, probably from that two years of conditioning of like, people are kind of like, could give you a disease that kill you kills you what a way to program people oh my no. god i have so much to say about that but anyways go on but you know like the thing i noticed too is like anytime someone hugged me in Copangon, it felt like literally like my chest pressing against their chest so you do actually feel that literal like heartbeat sort of connection. co-regulation yeah co-regulation which i didn't have a word for it um and how did it feel in your body when you were getting all those hugs um, yeah, like I said, at first, very strange and sort of, I felt kind of like an alien at first. I was like, oh my God, I like am so outside of this bubble. Like this is a bubble of people who knew each other. And at first I thought it was just your friends. Like, okay, it's just Brittany has very affectionate friends or Cuddly something. people. But then I went to an event that like oh, yeah. <laughs> you weren't even at and it was a bunch of strangers and they all greeted each other very much the same way where it'd be like, I'm talking like a full 20 second hug. Like Mm -hmm. you just stay on there hugging and then you sit down on the same cushion and are kind of like leaning against each other or like lounging on each other. And my first event, I was like, why are people on my pillow? Like I did, I was like, am I invisible? Like, can people not see me? It's just like, they were bumping into me. They were like, not like leaning on me, but kind of just like getting in my space in a way I was very like unfamiliar with. Not in your six feet bubble. Not in my six feet bubble. And so at first I was just like, oh my God, there is like a little bit of like, oh God, am I going to catch COVID on this island? You know, um, which is still, of course, a risk. And I appreciate safety. But um, yeah, I don't know. I guess because we did the DMT like my second day, I got over it real quick. <laughs> <laughs> and then... So how was it for you? Like, for, I, I think this is a really good thing for people who have never been to Copenhagen. Like, I would love for them to hear your perspective. Like, because you're very much, I want, don't want to say an outsider, but you're like coming from New York, coming yeah, from yeah. COVID, from like, you know, one of the most severe lockdowns in the world. Mm-hmm. How was it for you on the island? Because I talk about the island, but then I, th- I think sometimes, I don't know if people believe me because I'm like, the island is paradise. And I, I mean, I believe it. It's my paradise. But how is it for you? Uh, I would say it worked its magic on me. Really, it did. And to the degree that I'm like, how do I get back there? Because it's the most human I have ever felt. That's interesting. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, when you talk about dropping into your body or a somatic safety that you feel inside your own body, I definitely don't feel that very often. Um, And I remember the very like the seconds after I was coming out of my trip, (laughs) DMT trip and you and Jasmine were sitting next to me and I was, I had the most beautiful view sitting in this villa, looking out into the horizon. Thank you, Nathan. Like, yes, thank you, Nathan. Um, you know, just looking out into the horizon, the ocean and just like these hills covered in greenery. And we were, had the doors open. So it was just all fresh air. And I had this really, unusual feeling that I hadn't I didn't I don't remember having for a very long time 
if ever, which is just like, oh, I belong to the human race. I know that sounds weird, but it was like the feeling of, you don't, that sounds I, amazing. Yeah. I belong to the human race of like the sense of isolation and sort of alienation is so much more present and common, um, that for, and honestly, it didn't last long at first. Like that first, I felt that moment and my psyche kind of immediately like pushed it away. Almost like belonging was, um, unsafe. Like, it's like my body felt it for a second and then my psyche also was kind of like no you got to protect yourself like you can't trust people you know and this comes you know Mm -hmm. um I come from a a background that was not very uh not super safe growing up so like I mean I don't want to get into my background but I also have my own like survival instincts of I mean we met in group therapy (laughs) we met in group therapy (laughs) I feel like I've got a lot more work to do honestly um I've got I've come a long way but you're doing great I'm doing great I'm on my own timeline here yep respect the timeline um it's gonna be a quantum leap they'll just be like one day I'm like four (laughs) levels up (laughs) just do another DMT trip yeah um but yeah and I know that's the thing about like introducing psychedelics to the conversation adds a maybe a layer where it's not as relatable or it's kind of dismissible Mm -hmm. um but maybe this is something you can talk about with psychedelics in that they do allow your brain to experience something outside of the reality you have always lived within and like sometimes a system gets set up you know and the system doesn't have an avenue for change like even if it's not functioning well Mm -hmm. the system is like um it's working well enough so there's not like a lot of opportunities for that system like meaning your your own brain meaning your own reality uh to change so like when you do a psychedelic it gives your brain a chance to experiencing something outside of what you've always experienced and i think it can really give you a chance to change, like actually have some sort of positive change. And I think that for me coming into my body like that, then it was kind of like touch and not touch and go, but you know, throughout my time there on the Island in May, I'd be like, Oh, I'm present with these people. I'm dropped in and we'd be just like in a pile (laughs) <laughs> just like lounging together cut a puddle yeah and it's like this feels nice and i'd be like stranger danger and i'd feel it for a minute and then i'm like no but there is no stranger danger but you really do have to trust the people and if you've been touched assaulted abused, for sure which we both have yeah like if anyone's ever actually physically assaulted you then like it's not easy to be like these people are safe and i think that's a big part of it mm-hmm. probably so mm-hmm. how how were you able to feel safe or like what made you, what was, it was the, the people themselves okay. it was the people we were around it was the little community that you had curated and i'm not sure how it would be in the wild you know mm-hmm. of the world like how do you really figure out who's safe and it is i don't know that's kind of a tricky question mm-hmm. like who can you trust because i got back to new york and instantly it was like oh I no, I can't just touch everyone like the way I was in Thailand. Mm-hmm. Like I can't just lean on people. I can't just like <laughs> if they're being touchy with me, it means something very different than mm-hmm. it does on the island. Um, so I was able to do that because the people there were had all have all had experiences kind of like what we're talking about mm-hmm. of just being really secure in your own body Mm -hmm. i think that's a big thing because then you aren't needing it's like you understand you co-regulate or something but you don't need something from someone and there's not like a taking like no one there felt like they were trying to take from me yeah i i I think the thing i want to say there is that you know what whatever you believe in higher self source energy your higher mind all the things to me it's like we all have the opportunity to be directly connected to that source uh, where we can pull our energy, where we can ground in ourselves. And and I think on the island, this is kind of a, 
I don't know how best to put, but it's kind of like an accepted reality that we all are at least doing the best we can to connect to our own version of source energy. Mm -hmm. And then when we are coming together with each other, it's like we're just kind of bouncing that energy off of each other. And like, yeah. yeah. And that resonance, it's really difficult to explain because we don't have a vocabulary for it really. Mm -hmm. But what happened is... It, it's not 100% of people on the island have that energy, but you start, oh God, it becomes just like, like you gain a sight. Like you can just see the people who aren't going to, that are just aren't safe or yeah. aren't have a taking mm -hmm. energy when they come at you. And you're just like, whoa, it's like this bizarre, almost just like, ooh, like you just like lean back like, yeah. whoa, 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 no, 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 no. Um, and I don't know that, I mean, it was special to the island mm -hmm. and I don't know, there's like not enough of a mass of people in my everyday life in New York that I can operate mm -hmm. quite the same way. I kind of have to go into the opposite, you know, like on the island, it's like everyone's trustworthy except for like maybe one person who I have to kind of repel <laughs> but in the uh, in New York it's kind of like nobody is safe except for the occasional person I can let in mm. and it like really creates a different environment for your body and for your mind mm. and for your heart for sure I mean yeah that sounds terrible like <laughs> I'm like this is why I live on an island where you know I have a and I think one thing that's really important to say here is it's not like we're just, you know, floating around, like flowing. Oh, these people are amazing. Duh, everyone's safe. It's like, no, like I have been abused very severely. I understand from a somatic body level if I feel safe around someone and if not. And I understand that that's something to be very protective of. So it's something that I say to everyone in my community is like, I'm like the mom here. Like I'm doing everything I can to create a safe space for us all so that we can drop in. And then I'm, I'm asking and inviting everyone to co-create that safe space. Let's all, let's keep, basically there is something to be protected. It's so special mm -hmm. what we're building and it's not just like popping out of thin air. It's like something we're cultivating daily mm -hmm. through. And then, you know, people still have disagreements with each other. People still have, you know, drama or whatever, but then we all work together as a community. Mm -hmm. This is one thing I loved is like, we all kind of know what's going on in each other's lives and, and people are dating each other and everyone kind of knows it and everyone's kind of helping each other and co-regulating even on the relationship level. Mm -hmm. And so then there becomes this kind of accountability of safety of like, we're doing oh, yeah. this. Yeah, D is that something that resonates with you? Yeah, like if you, uh, if you're like fucking with the energy, you like aren't coming back. I don't know how to explain it. It's like mm -hmm. we were at a party where someone showed up and his energy was just not aligned with ours. And it's like he was there 30 minutes, even though he had traveled so far oh, to get yeah. there. Okay, I know what you're talking about, yeah you know, maybe he was just having a bad day. I'm not going to say anything about this individual, but other than like his, his, he wanted someone to pity him and he wanted like a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. And I think he wanted to sleep with me too. Yeah. There was definitely, like I say, taking energy. I feel like that's yeah. a word I came across somewhere while I was on the Island. Like, Oh, so much taking energy, mm -hmm. but you can feel it. You can feel it. And he just got sort of, he just like, couldn't, he didn't exist. fit it. Like, yeah. He just I like, disappeared he just like exited i feel like it just got like <laughs> repelled by the communal like positive vibes like he just couldn't be there because no one was giving him what he yeah we weren't feeding into it yeah just not feeding into it is huge and you know i understand like codependency mm -hmm. and that feeling of oh if someone's hurting you want to run to them and like take care of them and give to them and i feel like a lot of times when I see someone in negative energy, I do that. I'm like, oh, no, I got to go take care of them. Mm -hmm. But somehow when everyone is so positive, the one person who is like trying to take in that way, I don't know. Like I didn't feel the urge to go take care of them. Like, hey, there's so much abundant positive energy here for mm -hmm. you to absorb and transmute. absorb and yeah. like recycle, you mm -hmm. know, like bring it in, reflect it back. Yeah. And this is not to say that, you know, you can't have a bad day. We all have right, our bad right, days. Right. And this is one thing I love about the island when I describe it. It's like Indigo, like our kind of our main coffee shop and Shri Tanu. 
like at any given day you go there and someone's like having a meltdown like you know they're just in their emotions maybe it's the moon cycle maybe it's their period whatever whatever is happening and maybe it's something legit like one of our friends just passed away it's like but everyone is around them giving them a hug you know Mm -hmm. like if someone's really in their feelings authentically i think this is the thing it's being authentic whether whatever emotion you need to show that day it's like you are just being your authentic self and then that can still bounce the energy back and forth in Mm -hmm. a fluid way yeah I think it's when people are being inauthentic and then they're trying to take energy to kind of yeah. make themselves better. That's mm-hmm. when it doesn't work. Yeah. I will also say that just being, I did not know how big of a deal this was, but just being immersed in the elements. Yeah, We're fucking totally surrounded by nature. Like yeah. at any given moment, we're going to the beach, we're going to a waterfall. I mean, when you came, we were literally at Nathan's house for two weeks, just completely on <laughs> Wynom, the bays, which is my favorite part yeah. of the world. The windows are open, it's hot, you're sweating, you just kind of like have to... Take four showers a day. Take four showers a day, you're walking barefoot. Like constantly, I didn't wear shoes for two years. Um, There's air conditioning, so you can escape the heat, but like it feels like you're immersed. Mm -hmm. Like you're immersed in the the tides in the moon cycle (laughs) in the rain in the thunder which i think as humans we are meant to live like that you know right this is exactly we are nature we're just like so disconnected like even just being here in rosanna's house thank you rosanna for letting me stay in your house i love it i'm also just like where are the trees like i look outside and just like cement buildings yeah we're in a very beautiful part of lisbon just putting that out there i'm very grateful yeah i just i'm I love the island for that reason. Yeah. Even even your apartment has like 8,000 plants in yeah, it. Yeah. I basically want to live inside of a jungle inside <laughs> of my house. That's my goal. So I do think that that also contributes a lot to the feeling of dropping in to your body. It's like you're part of nature. You are nature. And mm, so mm. when you're not in this sterilized environment... You can actually feel your body shifting the throughout the day, throughout mm-hmm. the temperatures, throughout the elements, um, throughout the month with the moon. And I don't know. I feel like that just plays a huge role into what makes... I mean, being on the island, you're literally surrounded by, by water. So it's like extra strong there. Extra strong, yeah. But... Yeah, there's something that I learned in trauma awareness as well is that like... From a human perspective, 80% of what our experience is in this life is actually happening in our bodies on a somatic level. That's why I keep saying somatic because it's like I want us to pay attention that this is the sensations that are happening in our body. And then 20% is supposed to be in our brains to just kind of be the computer to process it, what is happening in our body and reflect it outwards, you know, maybe adjust it. Okay, I'm too hot. My body's too hot. Okay, I need to do something, whatever, whatever. But in today's world, we've flipped it the other way. We're like, we have put 80% of our processing of our experience in our heads and then 20% in our bodies. And then even then, when our body is hurting in some way because it's trying to tell us something that it doesn't like what's happening, we just give it a pill. We tell it to shut up. (laughs) Yeah. And that just makes me crazy. I want to like scream like, no, you don't need to get on antidepressants. There's just something wrong with your environment that your body doesn't like. And maybe that's what you need to change. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. Being on antidepressants, being on morphine. I understand all of these things. I've experienced all of them. And now I'm just so fucking sensitive to my body. I'm like, okay, what is happening? Mm -hmm. What do I need to do? How can I serve you better? You know? Yeah. Okay, we did a little pee break. We're, All right, back. we're back online. We're back. Uh, Michaela's asking me, are you going to edit this? I'm like, rough and ready. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Until you come out and do all the help me with the tech things. This is what we got. It's going <laughs> to be <laughs> it's great. what it is. It is what it is. Okay. So, but maybe the last chapter is now that we've gotten a flavor of your whole timeline. Thank you. We've got a pretty nice flavor of what the island is kind of like. Mm-hmm. They gotta, you got to be there to really experience it. Yep. Um, now you have a vision mm-hmm. for the kind of society you want to build on the island. And I feel like I really could interrogate you about this for like another hour, but Oof. let's do a, yeah. 
let's do the pitch like what's okay. the what have you, how have you been explaining it to people what do you want to build on the island so i want to make a prototype a framework of what we could live in, in our own society imagine like us coming together and being like i want to have access to organic fruits and vegetables i want my kids to be able to live in a safe environment i want to live on an island where we protect the nature and we're like most of Copenhagen is a national park and it's very small right I want to integrate with a local community and create an economy where we're all thriving and it's all abundant. This is completely possible. <laughs> and this is actually something I've been doing without realizing I was doing it. And also, so on the island, the, the demographic is Thai people, Burmese people. And then you got your hippies, which is like yoga, health and wellness. And then you have crypto people. We joke that it is crypto island. And so from a tech perspective, I call it mixing tech with tribalism. So imagine having our own community currency where we can have our an altcoin and people can buy into the altcoin and then we program it into the blockchain. If you don't know anything about crypto, it's fine. I can explain all of that later. Or I'm saying to anyone who listens, it's like you don't need to know about tech in order to really get this. It's basically just that we can have our own currency and then people who buy into that currency, we can program it into when you buy into it, a percentage of the profits go to missions. I call them making missions on the island. So Jasmine's doing coral regeneration. She's gone to all the farmers and found out who was actually growing or organic farming and created what we call, oh, I always forget how to say it, CSA, which is like... Community Supported S Agriculture. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> so basically making it so people pay a subscription every week or a month, and then you get a box to your doorstep of organic fruits and vegetables. Like knowing where your food comes from, knowing that it's all fresh. And then we have other friends who are making like amazing um, trauma aware schools for the kids on the island who are like, you know, working with the children, teaching them how to learn and listen to their bodies, how to drop in and really like just being good people to these kids, you know, who are becoming more and more sensitive as they come out. And I really believe that, that the more that we create this environment of safety, the more they can thrive and they can they can quantum leap because they don't have to deprogram all the things that we had to. So the goal is to create a framework of a society where we can all also like take over a couple of the resorts on the island and we can all live together if we want to. You don't have to live within the same place if you don't want to, but like you can be part of the community and there's events all the time and basically you feel like you belong and you're also, t you're connected to yourself so we have we're setting up programs some of my friends are some of the best facilitators i've known in the world for somatic experience like trauma awareness shadow work tantra which is really just connecting to your body not the sexual type <laughs> and then so like creating these programs where people come to the island they can what i call doing pick your own adventure so like go through a program of what you feel you need in order to feel safe to drop into your body and so be to become completely embodied and usually you're awake enough to know that you need to come and do that. And then, so connect yourself. The second level is connect to each other, connect to the community, come to all the events, do all the things that feel good for you. Also hermit, if you want to hermit, whatever, whatever. Mm -hmm. It's not a cult, <laughs> like do whatever the fuck you want. And then what I call connecting to the earth, which is making missions. So we, like, if you come with a skill set of like, you love the sea, then come join us and work on the core regeneration stuff that we're doing. It's like we're working with tech stuff in order to uh, quantum leap the amount of progress we can do. And we can really, like the Copanyang is, Co means island and Panyang. <laughs> Jasmine always says I say it wrong. Whatever, Panyang, Panyang. It is, it means sandbank. And it's known around the whole island to have sandbanks, which also means that there's tons of coral reefs around the island. It's like a very beautiful place. And a lot of it has died. So we are trying to regenerate it. And there's certain, f so, and then there's also, you know, missions for working with the farmers, working with the kids, working like planting trees, regenerating the earth. So the steps are connect to yourself, connect to each other, connect to the earth. And to me, that is the framework of what I want to make in a new society. And then I feel that we can film it I would love for you and Ben to come out and film it mm -hmm. and make a prototype and the kind of open source a framework for other people to come and make their own uh, and make their own in wherever they live. So, and then I would love to have hubs around the world where we can all have the same kind of ethos and basically the same framework of how we want to interact with each other. And then we can just, you know, go around in these bubbles of safety of like 
a place that you know that you can drop into your body and connect with people who are also taking care of themselves and taking care of each other and taking care of the earth. Mm-hmm. And there's something. So I came up with this idea of what I wanted to make on the island when I first got into crypto in 2020. And I was like, I want to have a mermaid coin. I want to like have our own um, our own version of this where we can like take care of the island and it can be like for Copenhagen and, you know, we can do all these amazing things. I didn't really understand the tech side. And then I started learning. And I was like, wow, this actually already exists. And there's something called a network state. And there's, I've researched there's 23 of them around the world who are popping up now and they're trying to start them in different ways. The favorite one that I've looked up and I've connected with is called Afropolitan. So it's for African people all over the world. Mm. And the goal of these network states is that you kind of create a country backwards. So you gather the people first, doesn't matter where they are in the world, under a certain, like we care about veganism. So anyone who cares about veganism around the whole world comes together online you start doing meetups, this and that. And then from there, you find a location that you want to have a hub where you live. And then you petition the government with all those people for rights and for access to different things. This is kind of what we've already done on the island. Like we already have our crew, we already have our community. We're already integrated in the local Thai community. And now it's just time to start building things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the Thai people that I work with there, they're super on board. They're like, Brittany, anything you want to do, let's go, let's do this. So for me, I have so many fun, amazing, what I call missions of like regenerating the earth and connecting us all to each other that I am like kind of happily overwhelmed by all of them. And so is Jasmine. Like Mm -hmm. she's her and my other really good friend, Federico, Feda, the three of us are starting what I call, we call Panyang Nation. And so this is with the name of the network state that we're calling, basically the new society that we're making, Mm -hmm. network state, whatever you want to call it, startup society, smart city. It's all the same thing. And if you want to join us, come to Kobanyang or reach out. This is also another thing is we have so many things that we could use help with. And people, <laughs> we I started, I worked in remote work for 10 years. Like we can do a lot of this remotely also. And this is also mm-hmm. what I love about a network state is that you can be part of it. It's also we're gonna, when we launch the coin soon, in order to support what we're doing on the island and also have a kind of a stake in it, you can buy into the coin. So this is part of it. And then anything that happens on the island that, uh, you know, helps the helps the the society also makes the coin more valuable it all just keeps going in this very beautiful abundance loop Mm -hmm. does that does that make sense uh yeah i think it makes sense i get really like overwhelmed because i'm like there's so much to say and i'm so excited yeah yeah no i love it because the value if you just like kind of boil it down it's like building a community and a way of life on the island Mm -hmm. a culture but a culture that involves like actual infrastructure whether it's digital or actual physical infrastructure Mm -hmm. that allows you to live out this culture like restoring the earth connecting with each other connecting with yourself Mm -hmm. dropping in I mean I think it's what governments were supposed to do and they kind of just maybe got too big or just lost their own ethos of what they were actually trying to do or maybe they weren't then they were just trying to control people i don't know whatever happened with <laughs> governments <laughs> in it's just like a sort of reclamation of like humanity in a way when and the I world think, is kind of falling apart and yeah like there's many like different a ways. lot that's falling apart and the more there's like i really uh, appreciate the infrastructure part of like because people have these values and they want them mm-hmm but then you just try and like what eat organic in a city. It's, it's so overwhelming. You like, try to like, 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 as, York, like yeah. there's like all this individual responsibility you have to take on, but you're stuck in this whole system where it's overwhelming. <laughs> it's overwhelming. And but imagine as a community on a very small island. So this is why I think it's a really amazing uh, way to do, create a prototype yeah. because it is so small that you can actually accomplish it. Like imagine trying to do this in New York City. Of course you're going to get overwhelmed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's an amazing prototype mm-hmm. idea. And even, I mean, even if all that happens is you get to live an amazing life on the island, which I don't think that would be the end of it by any means. Oh, but yeah. We're going to do it in the whole world. But the yes. whole world. <laughs> but, I mean, you're still creating a life and a community and a world, you know, a reality that, like you said, comes from reflecting the love, the care, the joy that you have inside of you already. 
Yeah, and this is like for a long time, the last two years, I had investors and people were like, let's make an eco village. Let's make a retreat center. And I'm like, this is great. And I also am like, it doesn't feel connected to the, like the, I don't want to say outside world, but like I want to integrate uh-huh. in the environment that I live in. I don't necessarily want to just live on the land. I want uh-huh. to like go out and be in, you know, with Thai people and like yeah, yeah. in the country that I actually live in. Right. Yeah. So this is why it feels a lot more real. Holistic yeah. Too. It's like, it's, and it's not just, <laughs> I'm not saying that those things, I have friends who are making eco villages on the island. I fully support them. I want to buy into it and like have my own house on the property. I love them and I'm very, so some of my mentors and they're doing what they need to, you know, in order to feel good and to do their thing. And I, I love it. And I just need to do this thing because this is what feels good for me. And right. it's like so much bigger <laughs> than maybe just making an eco village. But I feel like to me, it's th- this is the future. This is my Aquarius rising. It's like I see the fucking future. Is no one else seeing this? Right. That's how I feel most of the time. And yeah, I mean, just to totally give props to all those projects because they are the basis of inspiration yeah for sure and the experiment of like what works yeah what so works what doesn't work yeah. how can we do it better i think in the end we will have our own eco village but i think that for me integrating in with the the whole island feels more healthy yeah like you're saying holistic mm-hmm. and also i like to have my own space i don't necessarily want to like know every single person that i live next to and be able to hear them have sex and like all the things <laughs> like i kind of like living in my own bubble like, but i also right. love to live in a community in a tribe mm-hmm. where like everyone i love is within five minutes drive mm-hmm. yeah there's so much to unpack <laughs> know, in the so vision much. it's like it's so exciting i feel like i've been on tour through europe just like basically like preaching about it and everyone's like i'm coming i'm coming oh siri just went off on my phone um even siri is coming she's like i'm coming to kofi young <laughs> <laughs> but is there anything else we should say before we wrap up except for that i love you very much no oh, i love you very much too <laughs> um i don't think so because it would just be overwhelming it's like so much information right now yeah let's tease them let's just okay like drop you've it heard in. about the vision the next oh man i can't wait to i mean i'd be happy to investigate interrogate more with you but Mm -hmm. other people will come on here and they'll have different questions and different perspectives and uh, obviously much more education and specialization like I'm just very much coming out of this from like a broad perspective of like yeah but you're the filmmaker editor girl like you're the one who's looking at documentaries all the time that's true yes I'm looking at you like a story yes (laughs) I want you to make the story for us well I'd love that. Yeah. I don't want it. I don't. I would love it. It's different energy. I would love it if you would want. If it feels like a good response for you. Oh yeah, it does. <laughs> We're so into human design. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys are human design nerds, let us know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I okay. think I think I'm good. Amazing. So yeah. this is Brittany Vaughn, Michaela Earl. Yeah. On the Brittany Bond show, if, if nothing <laughs> else, if I can't find another name for it. Um, and sending you guys lots of love from Lisbon. We'll be, I'll be back on the island in Koh soon in Thailand. Michaela's going back to New York, but I'm, we were just talking outside of the episode that you, you want to come, right? Yeah. My time will come. <laughs> the timeline. Respect the timeline. Yes. She'll be back on the island soon. You can be like, you were the first one on the podcast so famous <laughs> <laughs> like last night we were at dinner one of the girls was like i saw you online on youtube Brittany," and i she was telling rosanna andrea was telling rosanna to meet me and then she was just like but you know she's my best friend <laughs> it's a very small world yeah okay but i love you and we'll wrap it up now i hope the tech <laughs> no trusting the tech works that i understand how to use this tech to upload it if you're listening to this you made it all the way through and i love you even more okay bye Say bye. Say bye. Bye.